This is level one of the CFA program, the topic on derivatives and the learning module on pricing and valuation of interest rates and other swaps. Let me begin with one of my very simple and perhaps even silly examples so that you can begin to wrap your arms around this concept of swaps. I know in speaking to candidates over the years, they tend to think this is uh, uh, one of the more difficult topics. I'm going to try to convince you here in level one, and then I'll do it again in level two and level three, which we get into a much broader and a much deeper level conversation of swaps. So let's start with this really simple example. Maybe it's even silly. Let's suppose that I own a beach house in North Carolina, and I love swimming in the water, but I'm worried about sharks. You, on the other hand, you have a lake house on Lake Norman in North Carolina, and you love swimming in the water, but you're worried about alligators. Are there alligators living in North Carolina? Let's just assume that there are. So you have a risk and I have a risk, but we have an underlying asset. So why don't we just swap? So you spend the, the summer, let's say, hey, on my, in my beach house, and I spend the summer in, in your beach house or your lake house. So we both love water. So we both get the benefits of the switching or the swapping of the assets. You no longer have to worry about alligators. I no longer have to worry about sharks. But, but notice what happens. We're just swapping positions. So now you, who no longer have to worry about alligators, now you have to worry about sharks and just the opposite for me. So in every kind of a swap, it's really just the grass is greener on the other side and the two parties are swapping risk positions. Now they're swapping cash flows that are reflective of those risk positions. So let's go to a great example, an interest rate swap. That, after all, that's the title of our learning module. So I own a fixed rate bond, you own a floating rate bond. So what are you hoping? You're hoping that interest rates go sky high so that your coupon payments uh, increase. Me, on the other hand, if interest rates go way up, I'm just standing there thinking, what am I doing? I got this little measly old fixed coupon payment when my buddy over there is getting these huge payments. So here we go. Instead of sharks and alligators, we're exposed to interest rate risk. One of us is worried that interest rates are going to go up. One of us is worried that interest rates are going to go down. So the suffering and the benefiting goes on either party. So what we just do is we agree to swap cash flows in that interest rate swap. So I think if you think of it in terms of sharks and alligators, there's still risk out there. Interest rates go up and down, and then there are all different kinds of swaps that are out there. But remember that when you hedge with a swap, it's not going to be a perfect hedge like we did back in futures contracts or forward contracts. All we're doing is switching positions with somebody else because we believe that their position is better suited based on the underlying economics. I have no idea if that is contained in these two LOSs. So swap contracts are similar and then can contrast the value and price. So that's what we'll start with, just two of these. We'll go ahead and spend some time on uh, swap contracts, how they look a little bit like uh, forward contracts, how they look a little bit like FRAs. And then we'll go back and revisit this concept of a value of the swap and the price of a swap. Now, the good news for you at level one is that we're really going to do this on a fairly general level. Now, we'll get into a little bit of math here in this slide deck, but it gets more complex, in, especially in level two. All right, so let's begin with looking at uh, a swap as a series of forward contracts. So look at the, uh, the two sides of the divided line there, a forward contract and a single period swap contract. What we're going to do is we're just going to shake hands, right? And we're going to agree at time T, let's suppose that's zero, time, time period zero. And we're just going to agree to do something in, let's, let's say, six months, whenever, whenever that is from now. And so what happens at six months for both a forward contract and a single period swap? Well, we just agree to exchange those cash flows. Whether, remember when we had our forward contract conversation, most forward contracts are on, uh, 
uh, on currency. So we're just exchanging US dollars for Canadian dollars, but in a single period swap, that underlying asset could be almost anything. And of course it could be a currency as well. So the important thing to remember is that they, that the forward contract and the single period swap contract, boy, those look like they're about the same thing and they are the same thing. So nothing interesting about a single period swap contract. And so I'm guessing that if the CFA Institute asked you a question on this, it'll probably just be a comparison of the two. Because really, there's, no, there's really no extra need to sign a swap contract for one period when you can do it really cheaply with a forward contract. But skip down to the bottom under the, uh, under the horizontal line, the multi-period swap. So this is where we get very interesting. So when you hear the term swap contracts, we're almost always going to be referring to a multi-period swap. So what we're going to do is maybe we'll sign a five-year swap that's known as the tenor of the swap and we'll exchange cash flows every six months so there are 10 there are 10 swapping dates over a over a five-year period and so notice that we shake hands we agree at time period t that let's suppose that's today and then in six months we exchange cash flows and then in 12 months and then in 18 months and we do that all the way out to uh, all the way out to five years now, one of the cool things about swaps, like other derivative contracts out there, is that if you sign a five-year swap that's called the tenor of the swap, you don't have to stay in it for five years. You could actually stay in it for one day if you wanted to, and you would just pick up the phone and call the swap dealer and say, hey, I went out, where's my money, or how much do I owe you to, to get out of the swap contract? And so think about this multi-period swap as nothing more than an exchange of cash flows now remember here, let me go back quickly here. This is called valuation of interest rate swaps. So most of this conversation in this slide deck is on those interest rate swaps. So we're probably gonna swap a fixed payment for a floating payment. And depending on whether we agree or whether we believe that interest rates are gonna go up or down, we'll determine whether we want to either pay the floating or receive the floating. So when you get on the exam and you get this question, because I'm pretty sure you're going to get a question like this, you know, just remember about the sharks and the alligators. Do you want to get rid of the, get, uh, avoid the sharks or avoid the alligators? So then the next question is going to be, this is, should be on the, on the front of your brains, is that, okay, if, if these swap contracts look an awful lot like a forward contract, then they probably look an awful lot like a forward rate agreement. Yeah, so of course, so we have a single cash flow that is single, uh, similar to a single period swap. All right, so think about a forward contract, a forward rate agreement, and a single period swap. Those are probably pretty much identical. But let's go ahead and, and ask the question, what about swaps and uh, forward rate agreements? How else are they similar? Well, it's going to be a simple calculation of the difference between a fixed rate of interest and the floating rate of interest. I always think of it as floating rate. Now, the Institute uses these three letters, MRR, the market reference rate. You know, so interest rates, they go up, interest rates go down. So we need to pick a market reference rate. And, you know, that rate could be it could be it could be Jim's floating rate of interest. Uh, in the old days, it was uh, LIBOR, and now it's uh, SOFOR, so they'll probably just call this the MRR on the exam instead of getting into the details of maybe some actual interest rates out there. Notice that second embedded bullet point. Both have symmetric payoff profiles and counterparty credit exposure. Boy, we spent a lot of time talking about different kinds of risk, but we always have to worry about if that other person over there is going to pay us when, uh, when, they, when they owe us. Uh, the visual that I always give my students when we have these conversations is I'm always one party and they're always another party. And I say, you know, suppose that I owe you tons and tons of money and you come knocking on my door. What am I going to do if I owe you, let's say, a trillion dollars? I'm not answering the front door and uh, I'm probably going to run out the back and I'm faster. I, you know, I get a chuckle out of my students being 61 years old and I say to them, look, I'm faster than you guys. So there's no way that you're going to catch me. 
So I give them that visualization about counterparty risk. Now, of course, there's really no knocking on front doors. There are exchanges, there are over-the-counter markets, there are clearing houses, there are all sorts of, uh, of intermediaries that help manage and identify this uh, counterparty credit exposure and to be able to say, okay, this person owes you money, let's go ahead and find that person. Now, here's a great exam question. Look down at the bottom in red. How are swaps and forward rate agreements different? Ah, and we're going to see this on the next slide. Um, with a series of FRAs, you have an FRA for one period, let's call it like this, and then you have another one, but the fixed rate here is going to be different than the fixed rate here, whereas in the swap, this fixed swap rate is fixed throughout that, what did I say earlier, that five-year tenor. And so with a series of FRAs, the owner is still exposed to a different layer of interest rate risk. I mean, everybody who enters an, an interest rate swap is exposed to interest rate risk, but with a series of FRAs, it's kind of a different layer. I'm not sure if it's a different level, but there's just some way, different way of looking at it. So here's the illustration I was telling you about. Just go ahead and look at the bottom first. Let's do the simple one. So here we are, you and I, we agree to swap uh, fixed for floating. So look at time period zero, what do we do? We shake the hands, there's the contract. And then at the end of each subsequent period, uh, one of us pays the fixed rate and look right across the top there, swap fixed rate payer, swap fixed rate payer, swap fixed rate payer. Those are all gonna be the same fixed rate and then the floating rate payer at the bottom, we don't know what that is because interest rates go up and interest rates go down. And so we don't know those payments, so we don't know what the net payment is going to be. That's why we have the dotted arrows and the, and the uh, fixed arrow going up and down. But now let's go up to a series of forward rate agreements. We sign the contract today and then we settle at the end of time period one, and then we sign another contract and then we settle at the end of time period two, and we settle at the end of time period three. Now we have an example later on in this slide deck where we're gonna come back to this slide and, uh, and we'll see exactly uh, how this works. So let's take a look at a three year bond. It has the following coupons, one and a quarter, two and a half, and three. Uh, there's the present value factor and there are the zero rates. Now I'm guessing that since the Institute provides all of this stuff, all of these input variables inside of the learning module that they'll, that they'll just uh, provide you with this kind of a table. Now, when we get to level two, we may have to compute those zero rates over there. So what's the question? Determine the par swap or the fixed rate for, this, for a three-year swap contract. What we're trying to do is we're gonna to try to come up with the fixed rate for this three-year swap that matches three one-year forward rate agreements. Because remember what we learn about in our economics modules, we learn that when bondholders, when they go to the bond market, you know what they're doing is they're processing all of the default risk and all of the interest rate risk, and they're coming together and agreeing on a yield you know, let's call that, let's call that any kind of a yield. Maybe it's a yield to maturity. Maybe it's a zero yield. Maybe it's a, maybe it's a par yield, whatever it is. But the bondholders out there are super smart. So they can come up with these numbers. And from, from that yield curve, we can infer what the market expects interest rates to do at some time in the future. All right, so a couple of steps that we need to take here. First of all, we need to figure out what that implied one year forward rate is going to be. Uh, one year from today and two years from today so we can do our FRA. And so this is really, boy, if you look at that formula down there at the bottom, you might look at that and think, okay, I, I can memorize that, but let me, let me just throw this right out the window. Suppose you have $100 today and let's suppose a year from now you have $110, right? What's your rate of interest? Well, we all know it's 10%, but if I forced you to calculate it, how, how would you do it? Well, the easiest way to do this is an F over P minus one taught you this back in time value of money. Future over present minus one, right? So how would we do that? We would say 110 divided by 100 minus one gives us our 10%. Well, in order to get these implied one year forward rates, we're gonna do the same thing, but our 
our future value, our f is not going to be 110. It's going to be the 3.22 or the 4.035, right? So we're just still going to do an f over p minus 1. But you have to pay attention to that exponent, the b minus a. Here, let me show you what I mean. So this implied one year forward rate, we're going to take the uh, 3.22. Uh, and we're going to divide it by the 2.25. Now remember, you have to add 1 to it, right? So just let me go back. There's a 1 plus and there's a 1 plus. So add 1 to both of those. And so you put the future, the 1032, that goes in the numerator. And you put the present, 1022, in the denominator. But you got to be careful about the, uh, uh, what did we say this back here? The B minus A. So remember, if we go out two years, you got to square it. So you have, you know, think about it this way f squared over p raised to the first power minus 1. So you get 4.2%. Uh, That's that implied forward rate. And then we need to do it again for that second year. And we're going to do the same f over p minus 1. But now we're going to do the 1.0403 divided by the 1.032, right? But we need to raise it to the 3 and the 2. So that should make perfect sense there. So remember, computing those uh, implied forward rates is just like 110 over 100 minus 1. Now, I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, this is, of course, the exact formula that you need, but I think it's just easier just to, just to do f over p minus 1. All right, so then what we're going to do, look over on the far right numerator. There's that little uh, s sub i. That's what we're solving for. We're going to say, what is that fixed swap rate that equates all of the inputs that we just computed? All right, so let's go ahead and put these right down at the bottom. So what are we doing here? We're going to take the 2.25, and we're going to discount that back one period. We're going to take the 4.209, discount that back two periods, and the 566, discount that back three periods. So make sure you know the numerator. The numerator is the implied forward rate. The denominator is the zero rate. And then on the other side of the equal sign, there's our S, right? So this is the three-year swap. So that's a S3. And we're going to divide by, you know, those same present value factors, 1.022, 1.032, 1.04. And don't forget, don't forget to raise them to the 1, 2, and 3 powers. We're, we're solving for S sub 3. So I guess this there's really no shortcut to do this with algebra. So you got to do all the math over on the left-hand side of the equal sign. So you get a number. And then what do you do? You factor out the S3 and do the 1 over each of those. And then, uh, well, you just do some other algebra there and you get 3.99%. Now, notice the LOS says, describe how swap contracts are similar. There's no way that that LOS says to compute or to calculate or to even demonstrate. You know, sometimes demonstrate means calculate. Describe doesn't sound to me like it. So here's the question then. Knowing this mathematics, you ought to be able to answer any question here. If you can visualize how to get that 3.99%, you ought to be able to answer those questions. All right, so here's the solution there, right? There's the 3.99%. That's the three-year fixed swap rate. And what that means is that's kind of like the equilibrium rate that equates all the really cool stuff that we did at the beginning of the slide. Do you understand this? The reason that we say that swaps are very similar, in some cases identical to forward contracts and FRAs, is because we use that identicality. I'm not sure that's a word. Similarity. We use that to come up with, well, let me just go back here, come up with this economics uh, equilibrium equation. Boy, that should make perfect sense. Now, here's this, uh, here's this previous slide, and this is a great slide because look at the bottom under our swap contract. What are we doing? We know that we're paying the, the, we're paying the fixed rate, 399, 399, and 399. But up in that series of FRAs, we're paying 225, 42, and 566. And of course, I'm just assuming that we're on that, uh, we're paying the fixed rate. You could uh, flip that on its head and receive the fixed rate. Now, remember what I said earlier that um, when you enter a swap today, tomorrow, you could get out of it. 
So what we need to do is figure out uh, how do we get out of it tomorrow? And really, we just pick up the phone and call the swap dealer. Now we're not going to pick up the phone. We'll probably hit a button. And the swap dealer is going to say, all right, yesterday you agreed to, let's just say, pay this fixed rate. The market reference rate today is uh, some number, either going to be higher or lower than that fixed rate. So you're either going to owe some money or you're going to not owe some money. Now that occurs during the lifetime of the swap contract, but you're not forced to do anything during that lifetime except, except on the agreed upon date. So notice what we have there, t equals one and two and three and four and five, all the way out to the tenor of the swap, probably five years, let's say. And so what are we doing? If we're the fixed rate payer, we're going to go ahead and multiply that fixed rate. What do we just get? 3.99% times the notional amount, and then we'll adjust it for semi-annually. What we're going to receive, the blue dotted line going up, is that notional amount, and we'll adjust it by the periods, but we're going to multiply it by the market reference rate. Notice in the blue, light blue boxes, we have market reference rate one, market reference rate two, market reference rate three and four and five, all the way out to T, because that market reference rate is going to float. Sometimes it goes up and sometimes it goes down. Now, of course, if if you and I are the different parties and I owe you $10 and you owe me $8, well, I'm not going to pay you 10 and you pay me eight. I'm just going to pay you two. So remember that uh, that all swap contracts are netted. That makes perfect sense. All right, let's have a little bit more of a conversation on this uh, on value and price. All we're doing here is the that the price of a contract, the price of a swap contract is nothing more than the difference between present values. This is why swaps were created because of the interest rate risk to which bondholders are exposed. So bonds pay interest every six months, which means that the net cash flows for swap contracts are exchanged or swapped every six months. And so think about my shark and alligator example. Right. You, we know what a shark looks like. I'm hoping you've watched Jaws. We know what an alligator looks like. I don't know if there are any alligator movies out there. Um, but think about those two and think about them as bonds. Well, the price of a swap contract has to be the difference between those two prices, the price of a fixed rate bond and the price of a floating rate bond. So read that first teardrop point with me. Periodic, periodic fixed rate that equates the present value of all future expected cash flows, floating cash flows, to the present value of the fixed cash flows. And so the swap price is nothing more than the difference between the price of a fixed rate bond and the price of a floating rate bond. Now that, it, that bullet point there is important. That swap rate is equivalent to the forward rate, satisfies the no arbitrage conditions. This is what I was saying earlier about the bondholders being super smart on the bond exchange. And so they're gonna laser in on that equilibrium exchange, uh, I'm sorry, that equilibrium interest rate so that there's not somebody way up here, can you see my hand, way up here ready to dive in and say, boy, you guys are stupid. I'm gonna go ahead and arbitrage your, uh, your price. So look at the blue line, the blue box down there, the periodic settlement value. All we're doing is taking the difference between that uh, floating rate, right, the MRR, minus the fixed uh, swap rate times the notional amount times the period. And remember, you as the investor, me as the investor, we get to pick, we get to pick the notional amount. Now, you're probably not going to get a, a $10 notional amount, but you might get a million dollars. You might get a hundred million dollars. This is what I tell my students all the time. I say, look, when you guys, uh, when you guys invent a time machine, what I want you to do is I want you to get in your time machine, go back, go set your time clock to tomorrow, go tomorrow, pick up a Wall Street Journal. Well, you couldn't do it because that's the day. Go two days ahead, pick up a Wall Street Journal, and then bring it back to me. So I know what that uh, that market rate is going to be. And so I tell my students, look, 
all we need to know if interest rates go up then we want to receive the floating rate so we're going to pick up the we're going to pick up the phone and call the swap dealer and say uh, we would like to receive the floating rate and we want a notional amount of a hundred trillion dollars I tell my students look if you could pull that off you know you'd be a trillionaire uh, in in minutes of time so remember that you get to pick the notional amount. And so if we're if we own a bond, if we're let's say a hedge fund and we want to and, and we don't want to sell that bond and we want to manage the interest rate risk, we might pick a notional amount that's equal to the our investment in that bond or maybe half or maybe 3 quarters or whatever it is. So look at that last uh, teardrop point. Net fixed and floating is exchanged at the end of each period. So let's work through a quick example here. Four-year interest rate swap. Notional amount, 100 million. Fixed rate, 2.5%. For the first six months, uh, the market reference rate is 0.85%. Uh, a couple of questions here. Calculate the first swap settlement value from Finlay's perspective. All right, so that's what we are. Um, we're receiving semi-annual fixed rate. So we're receiving the fixed and we're paying the floating. So what are we betting on? We're betting, since we're paying the floating, we're betting that interest rates fall. Uh, what is the mark to market value uh, under constant or declining rates? So let's go ahead and do the first part here. So the periodic settlement, we're just gonna take, use that formula from the previous slide, take the two and a half minus the 85, times the 100 million, there we go, uh, $825,000. Don't forget, don't forget to do the 0.5 <laughs> um, uh, every, every six months. Uh, how about if, they, uh, if the rates remain constant as set at trade inception? Well, that fixed swap rate is two and a half percent, which equates the present value of the fixed versus the floating. So there's going to be uh, no change in interest rate expectations. Uh, the present value of the remaining floating payments rise above the present value of the fixed rate. And so what will happen as the fixed receiver will realize a loss. If they decline, uh, that's probably uh, just the opposite, we're going to realize a gain. And so here, let me go back here. So just look at the bottom. You know, there's a sigma, present value, there's the floating rate, and present value, there's the fixed rate. So this is exactly what I was saying earlier, that your your um, your value over time is de depends on the difference between the prices of those two of those two bonds. And that takes us through this module. Uh, just two LOSs, but there's tons of stuff in here. And so I encourage you, as always, to go at the end of this learning module. There's one vignette, five questions, and I want to read one of these questions to you. And one of, I'm sorry, one of these answers to you. You know, at level one, you have all these multiple choices. You have three, you have three choices. But the Institute, over time, is not releasing questions that sound like this. They don't say, okay, if the interest rate goes up, uh, what happens to the value of the swap? A goes down, B goes up, C stays the same, right? So those sound like super simple questions. I mean, it would be awesome if you got simple questions like that on the exam. But what I want to do is I want to read you this, and you know, I can't see without with, with my glasses. So I'm just going to read you. Here's a question stem. I'm not going to read that. It's about an interest rate swap. But here's choice A. Can I read this to you? Since the client receives fixed and floating and pays floating swap, comma, it faces an MTM, mark to market loss, on the transaction as rates rise, comma, increasing the MTM exposure to the client. So notice in that question, it's not just increase, decrease, or stay, stay the same. So this is why I want you to go to the questions at the end of the learning module, get a sense of the depth of what you can be expected to know on, uh, on the exam. So thank you for watching and good luck studying.